and fellow philosopher, Ron Um, before I get started, uh, a friend cornered me, asked me to read something, and she's my friend, and yes, I'll do it. Um, uh, I have till 11.30, is that correct? Ish? Okay, all right. Um, I am a member of the human family, a citizen of the world. The achievements of men and women throughout the ages are my heritage. My destiny is bound to that of my fellow human beings. What we jointly create forms our bequest to future generations. May my life serve the good of my family. May our use of the earth preserve it for those yet to come. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, like Pam said, I generally take a very scientific uh, and data-driven approach to things. Uh, you will see a smattering of scientific things thrown in here. I'm not going to state studies. That's not what I'm here to do, is to throw studies at you. If you want to do that, I have reference material. We can do that after, okay? Um, today I'll be going over whether Buddhism is a religion or a philosophy, and what your views on that are. The Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, good or bad, and how morality plays into it. Non-attachment, impermanence, death, um, the humorous part, rebirth and karma. Uh, and then meditation, which to me is the crown jewel of what Buddhism brings to uh, Western science. So there's the saying that uh, when the science of the East, which is generally thought of as meditation, uh, meets the science of the West, the scientific method, then amazing and great things happen. And that's what we're starting to see right now is some of these studies that are coming out, the veracity of which you may question, uh, and rightfully so, because many of the same researchers that did them are questioning their own research, which is as it should be. Let's see. Uh, who am I? So I've been a Buddhist since 2003. Um, I am a meditation and mindfulness teacher. Uh, I am doing this largely through the digital medium and video games. Uh, my intent is that we hang out, or we can become like those we hang out with. Right? Uh, whether you hang out with sailors and pick up a, a really trashy uh, habit of swearing, or whether you hang out with really nice people and learn kindness. But the intent is to build these intention-built communities for video gamers that prosper and serve their members in their community. Uh, I am a humanist chaplain and celebrant. These two are not mutually exclusive. It is this and which is a very common uh, statement in Buddhist philosophy. Uh, I'm the Arizona Regional Burning Man contact. I've been going to Burning Man since 2003. Oh. It, <laughs> it is a wonderful time. Uh, I will wax eloquently on it as long as you will let me. Uh, so if at lunch you want to know anything about Burning Man, I have a Burning Man story for pretty much everything. Um, <laughs> Hospice volunteer, I've been doing this for a year. It has been very instrumental in my growth and development as a human being to care for another in that way. Uh, IT manager, uh, I do PD stuff. I'm a father of three. I have a 20-year-old daughter, 17-year-old son, and a seven-year-old little girl. So what brought me to Buddhism is probably the same thing that makes most of you interested in Buddhism. The belief that it could ease the sorrow or the suffering or provide me with a better way to manage my day-to-day -day life. And so I came to Buddhism through pain. Many of us do. Um, and you're searching for something to help and Buddhism is a philosophy as much as it is it technically it's a religion, it's tax exempt, yes I get it. <laughs> There's a lot to it, and I want you to make your own decision about whether you think it's a religion or a philosophy. Um, here are my resources. Uh, Sam Harris, many of you know, Daniel Siegel, psychiatry UCLA, What is the Nature of Mind? Shinzen Young, he is my teacher. Uh, that is uh, who I study under. Uh, his methods are currently being taught at, or investigated, and the current scientific research 
at those universities. <coughs> Cheg Meng Tan is the Google's mindfulness creator, and they created Google's mindfulness program called Search Inside Yourself, and they present mindfulness in a business environment with performance metrics, and here's why to do it in a business environment, and here's what it's good for. Uh, and the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, two of the best guys I know. <laughs> I don't know them, but I would like to see them. But, um, they got together and wrote that book called The Book of Joy uh, for the Dalai Lama's 80th birthday party. Uh, it was a marvelous book. Uh, if anyone wants recommended reading or anything like that, pick one of these. Um, pick one of these. Buddhism, religion or philosophy? Um, we're going to make this determination. You're going to make this determination for yourself. Because part of this Buddhism journey is an experiential process. It is for you to experience it yourself. There is no divine being. There's no great creator in the sky, no amazing thing, making decisions, no anything like that. Uh, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, was a prince in India who cast off all of his worldly possessions and tried to find a better way. He was a man just like every other man and died just like every other man dies. And no different. Um, so it, it deviates from many other religions in that way. Uh, the integrity of the teaching. So when people say, oh, the Buddha said, but well, we don't know what the Buddha said because the Buddha's teachings weren't written down for a couple hundred years until after he was dead. So, very similar to other uh, religious people, you need to question the veracity of that. And you should. And that, that's, that, that is one of the main points behind Buddhist teaching, is um, take it with a grain of salt. Take this information that you're getting today and question it. Ask yourself if it is really good for you. Because that's when it comes into practice. That's when it makes a difference. System of experience, not dependent on a system of faith or belief. It's based on experience. When someone tries to get you to meditate or do something, it is so that you can have that experience like they are having. Okay? Uh, the, the idea that um, <laughs> uh, it, it's something to be practiced and it's something to be done and it's something to be lived, and it's something to be embodied. It is not a, a belief system. Um, the evolution of Buddhism. So um, there's many different sects, many different teachings. I wear black robes. Other people wear saffron robes. Other people don't wear robes. Some people meditate. Some people don't meditate. You never really know. And there's many different types of Buddhist philosophy, or Buddhist structures and ways of coming about many of these ideas that we'll be getting into on impermanence and all of those weird things. And so the Zen Buddhists in Japan approach it very differently than the Vietnamese do, than the Tibetans do, than the Indians do. And, and so all of these have different approaches on how to get at the mark. Um, there's the analogy of the moon is enlightenment, and you point your finger to the moon, and so, but they're all pointing to the same spot, right? There's all these different practices to get to this point of, oh, I understand myself better now. Um, stoicism. If anybody studied stoicism, you might find a lot of really great similarities here. Um, and when I started studying Stoicism probably two, three years ago, I was like, wow, this is a Western philosophy that uh, sits really nice with humanism and, and, and understanding death and understanding, uh, appreciating what you have and, and all of the great little things that, that Buddhist philosophy brings you as well. Um, so again, this is one approach. Uh, if you like Stoicism, find that approach. Find what it is that makes you happy and do that thing. Um, Four Noble Truths. Um, this is one of the um, 
cores of what most Buddhists agree is accurate, the, the nut of Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths, that there is suffering, the origin of suffering is a craving, a desire, or attachment towards that thing, and there can be a liberation from that suffering, and there's a path to do it, okay? So, uh, because this is kind of the nut of it, I want to make sure that we understand that suffering is um, inherent. It's there in life. It's there, there. We're all going to experience it to some sort or another. Okay? Um, the origin of that suffering is usually a craving for something or an aversion from something. Either you want more of a good thing that you don't have, or you don't want more of that bad thing that you don't have. And that that wanting it to be somehow other than how it actually is, is where that, that unhappiness comes from. Um, there can be a liberation from that suffering. If you just said, hey, there's suffering, here's what it is, ha ha, uh, that would really suck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the third is that there can be an easy, and liberating is, is a, that's something that 40,000 hour meditators get to, but, um, you definitely notice a ceasing, a lessening, a things become a little bit better. And when you can start seeing that and appreciating that, that makes a difference. Uh, the Eightfold Path. So the Eightfold Path are these things. Uh, view, intention, speech, action, livelihood, effort, concentration, and mindfulness. So if you do these things right, you're on the right path. Um, view is your perspective, intention is what you think, speech is how you talk to people, action obvious, livelihood, arms dealer, or a, uh, a nice person that helps people out. <laughs> I, I, there's two different ways. So livelihood factors in there. Effort, how much effort do you put into it? Uh, how, do you, how do you embody yourself in the world? Uh, concentration. Here's where concentration and mindfulness get into the meditative qualities of, hey, are you focusing and present on what you're doing at the moment? Or are you thinking about whatever it is that's rolling around in your head? Uh, yeah, there's that. And that is mindfulness. So, and I will go through the definitions of those in a little bit better. But good and bad. So, you said, what's right, right? What's right livelihood? Who makes those decisions? Who... What? Who, who, who was right and wrong, right? So, um, good and bad are very fluid concepts in uh, most moral systems. So, there's a parable called Maybe about a uh, old farmer who has a horse, and the horse runs away one day, and everyone's like, "Oh, how sad! Your horse ran away." And he's like, "Maybe." And, and then the horse comes back the next day with four other horses. And everyone's like, oh, how great! <laughs> Maybe. Well, the next day his son breaks his leg trying to tame one of the horses. All his neighbors are like, oh, how horrible! Well, maybe. And then the next day the army comes through, collects all the young men who are able to fight, but his son doesn't go because his leg is broken. <laughs> Good? Bad? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Um, you don't really know. And it's hard to determine whether something that is bad for you now won't be a good thing in the future. I personally have gone through very difficult times that turned out to be probably the best damn thing for me. And um, so when you can start seeing some of that, that's, that's awesome. Because um, I know you all want definitions, because you're my kind of people. Uh, generally, it is free from greed, ill will, or the seeds of future suffering. So I want to talk about skillful. Okay? <clears throat> skillful, sometimes there's just no good decision. Sometimes it is a skillful choice and a less skillful choice. And sometimes that's all you've got. And so when you can put your... Is this a skillful thing to do, as opposed to that idea of good or bad? Does this serve the person that I'm working with? 
Is this help that other person in some way? Is this kind? Is this compassionate? Does this align with my values? Then, then it's a skillful thing. And will you make mistakes? Will you be like, yeah, I thought that was skillful at the time, but it sure wasn't. <laughs> yeah, that happens a lot. <laughs> that happens a lot. Um, reacting and responding. So um, there is a big difference between reacting to something and responding to something. Um, I hope to teach law enforcement officers uh, meditation, and it is my uh, it is proven that the ability to get from a responsive nature, ow, I hit you, I hit you back, to a ow, you hit me, all right, well, let's go do the thing, because now you hit me, and we got to do the thing now that you hit me, and, and to get out of that reaction mindset. And when you can accomplish that, you can get from Someone cut me off in traffic, I hate you, I'm yelling obscenities, and my children are in the back seat listening to me. <laughs> or, oh, okay, well, I hope they're okay. <laughs> because there's nothing you can do about it in that moment, right? It is what it is. How you react to it, how it's skillful for you, is, is, is the key, is the crux. Um, but that is generally the definition of what most Buddhists see as good, free from greed, and that is uh, you know, <laughs> ill will or the seeds of future suffering. So the seeds of future suffering is the caveat. You don't, sometimes you don't really know, but you make your best decisions, your best guesses. So. Non-attachment. Um, the root of suffering is attachment. Um, so from an objective perspective, outside material world, we all live by the, yeah, it's great to not collect things and, and live the good life, but we all like our luxuries, we all like our things. But beyond the basics, I think most the, the idea is that the material things don't bring lasting happiness. They don't. Um, and it is through your experience of this, through your deep knowing of this, that you go, all right, well, do I need to buy the next widget that's out? No, because my current widget's just fine. Um, and when you can when you can divorce yourself of that need and that, that desire because that's what our society is today, like it or not, it is, and when you can start managing that with a little more skill and intention and attention, then that, <laughs> it's been great for my pocketbook. <laughs> it's been great for my pocketbook. Uh, from a, a subjective perspective, so um, non-attachment to the internal. So this is where there's one thing that we're going to talk about, which is indifference. And I don't want you guys to think that equanimity means indifference. And I'll talk about that in a second. But from an internal perspective, um, non-attachment and having equanimity with whatever is arising in your present moment, okay? Without resistance or push and pull. My teacher, Shenzhen Young, has a... Uh, a math algorithm, actually, for suffering, uh, which I love the guy because you have an algorithm for suffering? Sure, I'll take that. But it is uh, suffering is equal to the pain times the resistance. Okay? So the more you resist it, whatever that pain is, the more you're suffering. So if you have that with equanimity, if you have a pain in your knee with equanimity, the less you resist it, the less you suffer. If you crave for the relationship that you used to have that you don't have anymore, your resistance to that creates more suffering. And so when you can have equanimity <coughs> to these things and not push from or pull towards something, that gives you a very loose place to have these, these discussions with yourself because that's what you're doing. You're, you're like, oh, I wish I had that relationship that I don't have anymore, and okay, that's your internal dialogue and your internal self talking to yourself. 
and you're spinning yourself in a place and you're attaching these things. I've done it, I'm sure every human has done it. Um, but these build this skill of, of working with this so that you can, you can manage these internal dialogues, these internal feelings that happen, um, uh, things that happen in your life with as much skill as you can. They're tools, they're skills. Okay? Skills that you learn, no different than learning to play a musical instrument. Okay? Uh, you put the hours into learning to play a piano, you'll learn to play chopsticks. A little bit more, you'll learn to play a song. Enough, you can play in a school concert. Better, you can play in a band. Awesome! That all takes practice. All of these are just skills. They are not inborn things that you magically work at. You build and you work at them. And if you build and you work at them, they have material uh, benefits. Uh, indifference. So a lot of people think, well, if I'm just going to sit there and, and be equanimous with everything, then I just don't give a damn, right? Nope, nope, nope. Uh, Buddhism, uh, my perspective, and I, again, this is just me, one human being's perspective of Buddhism based on my experiences and teachings, uh, based on a lot of other people's teachings too, but uh, yeah, it is active and engaged. Um, I can have equanimity with you, with the pain in my arm from you hitting me. It doesn't mean that I am uh, equanimous with you hitting me. So in a series of spousal abuse. I have to accept the fact that I was abused. I don't have to accept the fact that that individual's in my home doing that. That's not what equanimity is, um, and that's not how to go about that. It is active. You see something, and you engage with it. The Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu has a saying, when you become frustrated by all the things in the world that you can't change, that you can't fix, start where you are. Do what you can. In this moment, to the people that you talk to, whether that's a smile to the barista, or uh, hospice work, or, or whatever it is, however you choose to engage, that is, that is active, that is doing something, that is improving the world through your actions, through your embodiment of your practice. Impermanence. You are here. Um, the idea, everything changes. Okay? Nothing stays the same. Whether it's going to go from good to better, good to worse, something, it's going to change. Right? Um, and this becomes important when you start getting stuck on things. I always feel this way. Uh, depression is a particularly nasty one when you can't see the impermanence of it. When you say, I am this depression, I am these feelings, they will never change, that's a horrible place to sit from. And when you can know in your bones that Okay, this sucks, but it's going to change, all right? It's not going to continue to be like this. Then that gives you that ability to manage that more skillfully, more effectively. Is it easy? No, because we're all human. We all have the same foibles and the same problems. But they are better skills. They are better tools for you to human with. Um, so when you get to the point where this too shall pass, um, or not always so, as some other people say, um, <clears throat> you become a little more free with the things that are happening. Because if I'm having a bad moment, and I, I got this from, I, I used to have bad weeks, or bad months, or bad years. No, now I have bad moments. Uh, I, I went and talked to a friend of mine, and they're like, yeah, I don't have bad days anymore, I just have bad moments. I'm like, that's brilliant. That's brilliant because when you know that, yeah, I'm having a bad moment now and it's going to change, that's all right. That's good. That's great to know that. It is always changing. The upside is that in your good moments, 
in those moments of joy, of happiness, of, of love, this too shall pass. Savor it. Enjoy it. Right? Love those moments and appreciate them. Sink into them and go, this is why I do these things. Right? And appreciate those moments. Because as much as meditation and, and mindfulness is about, and Buddhism is about fixing yourself, it's also about managing and helping others. And um, yeah, when you can have that and bring joy and happiness to other people through embodying that and understanding that, hey, it's okay, and, and help your friends through that, and that's, that's really valuable. And I, I really, that's one of the reasons I do this. Death. Um, I'm sorry if this makes you uncomfortable. Thank you for coming here today. Uh, this does make people uncomfortable. Uh, and uh, it is something that we all must face. Uh, depending on your belief, whether you're alone, whether you're together, uh, we all must go through this process. The fact that we run from it, we hide from it, we flee from it, we do everything to avoid the idea of death happening, it is as much a part of our life as being born. How do you prepare for that? How do you manage that? How do you work with that? Um, in my hospice practice, that is what I do. That's what I love. That I love, because for me, it provides a sense of priorities, right? Um, with the deep understanding and knowing that you will perish, how does that change your values? How does that change your day-to-day -day life? How does that make you do something different, okay? If, because, because I look back on something and I say, will I appreciate that or will that matter to me on my deathbed? If it, if it does, then do the thing. But most often, no, it's not. It's not. I'm spinning my wheels and spending my energy, my lovely, lovely time that is my most valuable resource on Whoever cut me off and the story I'm telling myself about it. They shouldn't have, and who are they, and I'm me, and all of those stories that we all have. And it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And when you can sit there and you go, is this how I want to spend the rest of my life? And ask yourself those really deep questions and, and, and plumb those depths because it's the only life you've got. You're the only you you've got. Dig into your mind and your heart and go spelunking. It's a wonderful place in there. It's kind of dark at times, too, but uh, interesting, interesting. So it comes from a deep knowing that you will die. The process is, is in Buddhism, they will spend um, hours meditating on the process of death. Just the process. Their body decomposing, everything going away, and, and a deep realization that, no, I'm going to be gone. This is it. I'm gone. How does that affect my loved ones? How does that affect my friends, my family? All of those things in relationships, they do deep, deep meditation on. And through doing that, you, you come to the realization that, oh, well, these are the things that are really valuable to me. Because when I was going through that whole death meditation, my brain was like, oh, no, not my daughter, not my daughter. Okay, <laughs> well, take that and use that. Recycle that reaction and spend that on your daughter. <coughs> Rebirth. All right. <laughs> um, it's a theory. Okay. I don't ascribe to it. Uh, it is not my personal viewpoint. Uh, I am presenting it here because it is a part of uh, the Buddhist religion. Uh, this is one of the things that makes me go, yeah, religion, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the ideas behind it are that, um, and there's a, there's a koan, who were you before you were born? What was your face before you were born? 
okay? And that idea of where were you before you are now is probably going to be where you go after. And, and it, it's all bullshit. Because no one fucking knows. <laughs> it's all hearsay, happenstance, until I go and come back. It's experiential, right? Buddhism's experiential. Until I go and come back, I don't, I don't have an opinion on it. It's like, it's like debating whether the light in a distance is hot or not. Well, you don't know. It could be a light. It could be a fire. It could, you don't know. You just you don't know. You don't know. I think it's silly. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are all star stuff. At, at, at the base of it, we are all the atoms from way back beyond. There is a lot of interconnectedness talk from that perspective. So as you look at, oh, we're all interconnected and things like that, well, we all work together and have an interdependency between one another. None of us is an island. We didn't grow up learning language on our own. We didn't grow up learning to write on our own. All of that was taught to us. Uh, had we grown up in our own little individual silo box, we'd be playing in the mud somewhere. Uh, so we are independent, we are dependent on others for everything that we have. And that illusion that we aren't is, is where we can sometimes get into trouble. So, um, karma. Karma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so the Dalai Lama has a quote Karma means action, and action motivated by compassion is good. Okay? Um, I don't personally ascribe to if you do something, something automatically bad is going to happen to you. Um, that's the common idea of karma. If I do bad to someone, bad's going to come hit me. I think, and there are other people that believe this as well, so I'm presenting this, is that what you see in the world, what you pay attention to in the world, is what you see. So if you pay attention to the blue cars on the road, you'll start noticing a lot of blue cars. If you start paying attention to the bad shit that you're doing in your life, you're going to start paying attention to the bad shit that's getting done in your life. And so what you pay attention to and what you devote your time and attention to is generally what you're going to perceive. Okay? So it kind of takes it out of the spiritual and the whole, oh, there's someone out there going, that was good, that was bad, you're going to get bad karma for that one which is not, um, not something I would ever <laughs> um, Neurons that fire together, wire together. So when you are focusing on these bad things and seeing these bad things in the world, you're building pathways. Everything that you ingest, everything that you take in, you are learning, you are building pathways. The more that you ingest of the things in your life that do not serve you, the more your life is not going to serve you. <laughs> um, and um, this is shown scientifically on uh, brain scans. So uh, people that do, and I'll get to this in a little bit, but people that do different types of meditation have different neuroplasticity in different brain regions depending on the type of meditation that they do. There are different activation points. Uh, compassion meditation is different than insight meditation. They activate different locations in the brain, and neuroplasticity has a different effect. So a, a master meditator like um, Mathieu Ricard, who's the happiest man on earth, uh, has very different neurons because he spent his life meditating on compassion and love versus the Dalai Lama, who spends his life meditating on analytical meditation. That's his approach, right? So they have different brains and get built in different ways. Um, all right. Meditation and mindfulness, mind training. Um, 
So this is where it gets into meditation and mindfulness. So before I continue on, I want to see if there are any questions about the religion, philosophy, anything that we've gone over yet, because the, the, the crown jewel really is the meditation and mindfulness practices. How does this, how do these skills, how do these things help me feel better? So are there any questions or anything before I continue on into the meditation stuff? Yeah, I just can't understand why the Buddhists are being so terrible to the Muslims and part of the world, given what you said. Yeah. Uh, there is no good reason for some, uh, a human being to be unkind to another human being. I mean, uh, we can have differences of opinion and we can have all kinds of uh, disagreements, but violence is not a answer and I don't ascribe to anything that looks like that at all. And that's wrong. Do you, do you suggest that it's not in our best interest to watch the negative news that we see every day in the press? It, it is best to be informed, but don't ruminate on it, because that's what happens. I mean, um, I'll give a very personal example. 9-11 happened, okay? I was informed, and I watched freaking everything, everything that was there. Is it healthy? No, no, no. But there are things happening in the world that we absolutely need to be informed on. And so if that is the method that you get that, yeah. But don't watch it over and over and over and over because you are, that is what you're ingesting. That is what you're ingesting. And that's what you will become. That is what you'll become. Yeah, Ron, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I think it's been a great presentation so far. I'm, I'm not really into the presentation, so my, my wife handles that in that house. <laughs> um, there was a slide, I was really curious about a slide called Similarities, under which you had some people's names and topics like Stoicism, a couple other people's names, I believe. Uh -huh. And then it mentioned Bill Clinton. He's a Stoic. I have a hard time reading, sir, and it is very really positive. <laughs> presentation that you would thank you for your patience that you would even bring up the name Bill Clinton that man is a sexual predator and should probably be hanged from piano wire for what he has done so, so yeah, you know, he had his name up here as something positive the result is he's, he's a, a famous shot. person who's a stoic that's the point there's a lot of famous people uh, athletes there are a large number of athletes and performance-oriented individuals studying Stoicism as part of a team sport. Professional athletes studying Stoicism because it improves their performance and their perspectives. And it's, it's, it's these types of performance-type enhancements. And, and yes, it's great to be nice and bless out and feel better and all that. But when you can move that needle on a performance metric, there's a lot more people that are going to sit up and pay attention. And have you ever had somebody bring that issue up before? Uh, this is the first time I've done this presentation, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to go back real quick about, you gave the example of 9-11. One of my all-time favorite quotes is, anger is an energy, from John Lydon. Um, I brought it up before in the philosophy meeting. Um, the way I take that quote is, be angry, but turn it into a positive energy. Where does that, where is that line from turning that, ang from being angry about, say, the Rohingya and what's going on in Myanmar versus just being overwhelmed with it like you were with 9-11? Yeah, uh, great question, thank you. So, um, I will take a cue from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, because he's much smarter on this. Uh, it is when it is righteous anger. Okay, now I'm going to, because righteous and archbishop, but uh, the idea is that it is not self-serving anger. It is anger for, born out of compassion for another human being, okay? It is not anger for yourself. It is not anger for the injustice. It is anger at the situation that is happening and how to take that and resolve it, because you're absolutely right. You should take that energy and redirect it, reframe it, however you want to do that, and point that 
in a productive way that serves you, as opposed to, ah, I hate it, and yeah. Okay, back here. So uh, perhaps my monkey mind isn't being patient, and you're going to get to it later, but in your primer in Buddhism, um, would you care to discuss at least briefly um, notions of enlightenment and notions of our Buddha nature, which will ultimately, you know, is underlying. So I, I, guess, I guess you're going to get to it. Yes, right, yes, that, that is, uh, what is enlightenment? What is mindfulness? Let's have a freaking definition. Thank you for being pedantic. <laughs> we'll let Ron move on and yeah. save any questions till yeah. the end. We'll yeah. have more time for questions. All right. So, uh, why? Uh, mind training. So, everybody understands exercise, right? 50 years ago, 100 years ago. If you'd have told somebody to put a heavy weight in their arm and do this over and over, they'd have looked like you were nuts. What do you mean that's going to be good for me? What? Why? Well, no. Well, that is exercise as we now understand it. Um, meditation is exercise for your mind. Okay? Just like sports are exercise for your body. Okay? Many different types of meditation many different roads to get to somewhere and um, if you view it in that idea it's like exercise I gotta put work into it I get things out of it I put good work into it I get the good things out of it okay um, teaching these skills um, it's my belief and here's why I'm up here talking to you it's my belief that if I can get one person to go, huh, that was interesting. I might look that up on Google after, or I, I, might, I might do the one thing, then I would have made a difference. I would have made a positive impact. I would have helped you to learn a skill. And if I help you learn that skill, that helps you to become more of a human being that you want to become. You get to know yourself at a deeper and broader level and when you do that, you become more peaceful. When you become more peaceful, all of your interactions are more peaceful. <laughs> and the change has to come from within, from us as a society. It is my belief uh, that, that change needs to come from within. Uh, if we can change ourselves and make ourselves more peaceful with each other, then that will have a material impact. Uh, and that is why I do this. That is why uh, I, I have the dream of a peace, more peaceful world. I do. <laughs> this is how I do it. Um, when you get to know yourself, you have positive perspective changes. Um, you don't change unless you're uh, ascribed to the belief that you're arising in every moment and departing in every moment. That, 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 that's a more advanced boost thing. But, um, but your perspective changes. So as you get to know yourself better and become more compassionate, become um, more spontaneous, you become more calm. You have more time between your reaction and your response. Then what happens is your traits change. You as a human, as you embody these things, not peak experience. So, for a long time, people have been talking about peak experiences on the meditation cushion. I had this wonderful transcending experience, yay! Well, you're still a butthead when you get off the cushion. <laughs> Not any good, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so, where these science and meditation is going is how does this change your baseline? How does this affect your steady state? How does this affect you when you're not doing anything else. Because that's when it counts. That's when it's important. That's when it matters. Um, <clears throat> so uh, research is currently being done in that um, there's three general areas, mind, body, and emotional regulation of where meditation has been found to be most effective. Um, the places where the most scientific evidence is apparent uh, is in depression, 
had anxiety, it is not a medical cure, it is helpful. It's a tool for you to use. Uh, stress. There is a mindfulness-based stress reduction in BSR, very popular. Uh, that is where most of the science originated because uh, John Kabat-Zinn took this program and said, here's an eight-week program. The scientists went, shit, beginning, and we can study that. Okay? <laughs> and, and so they started doing that. And over time, these studies have changed and morphed and, and, and had a, an effect, but most of the, most of the data is anxiety, stress, depression, okay? All kinds of other studies that are out there, uh, and I'm sure that you've heard that they'll make you food and all kinds of stuff. Um, another thing that is interesting is longevity. Um, on the end of your chromosomes are telomeres. Telomeres, for whatever reason, don't know why, appear to be longer in, in master meditators. So, and this is not my hours of meditation, this is the good guys' <laughs> hours of meditation. But, um, but the idea is that as your telomeres shorten, you age, okay? So that is the, the current science behind why and what, that ha what, what happens there. Um, what is meditation? Pedantics. So, um, <laughs> concentration, sensory clarity, and equanimity all working together, okay? Um, <clears throat> people say my blah, blah, blah is my meditation. Okay. Uh, are you concentrating on it? Is it a sensory experience? Are you focused on that sensory experience and part of it? And are you exhibiting equanimity towards it? If yes, we'll have that discussion. <laughs> we'll have that talk. And we'll talk about it, because it might be. Um, dancing to music can be a meditative thing. Um, there is a spontaneity that happens in that, uh, in that moment that is wonderful and beautiful when you're just, oh, I'm moving and I didn't even know I was moving. That's, that's, for you. that's, that's amazing. Um, but you have to focus on it, you have to observe it, and you have to be okay with it coming and going. Because it's going to go and it's going to come. Um, even better, a way of paying attention on purpose, non-judgmentally to the present moment. Or, to tell if you're meditating, what am I experiencing now? Okay, how about now? Yeah, now. Yeah, now. Okay, and that's, that's, that's it. So you have to be focused with your concentration on your sensory clarity with equanimity. Uh, we went over this, uh, radical non-interference with the natural flow of sensory experience. So um, if you think of your equanimity like a liquid, okay, um, something happens and it needs to go through you, right? Something happens to you and you need to process it. You can either have that, that okay, I'm going to view it with like oil and it's just going to push through and shit's going to fly all over and that's no good. Or fog, okay, well fog, how do you resist those things? How do you allow them to come into your life and leave your life? And that is that equanimity that, um, that you practice in meditation. Because, we'll get to that, we'll get to how to do that. Uh, what is mindfulness? Um, the informal practice, uh, present moment awareness, can be applied to any waking situation. Uh, this is embodying it. This is altering your traits. Uh, Daniel Goldman and uh, Richie Davidson uh, did a book called Altered Traits. And it is a wonderful book on, <coughs> on the current science that just came out two months ago. They're the leading scientific uh, neurocognitive, neurocognitive uh, research or whatever it is. But uh, anyway, they had a, uh, a point on, hey, it, what really matters is the traits. And because they've been studying peak experiences for a long time, they're now starting to study traits on how this changes humans over time. Mainstream mindfulness. Yay, mindfulness will do this, and mindfulness will do that, and it's great, and we love it, and it's wonderful. Um, it's no longer guided by mystics and gurus. There's a lot of people, uh, 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 very scientifically focused, very non-woo-woo, very show me the data, give me a good reason to do this, and I'll 
I'll do anything. This sounds fine. Um, Tim Ferriss, a uh, podcaster who you may or may not know, uh, estimates that over 80% of his high performers are meditators. That's a pretty interesting statistic. Um, meditation is recommended by medical professionals. If you go into a medical professional, they might recommend meditation for you. There's a reason for that. Um, it is no longer a religious practice. It is available in a secular way to every human being, and that is the point of my teacher's program, is to take all of the dogma and the bull out of it and just say, here, here's what it is. These are exercises, right? Exercises for your mind, exercises for your body. Let's analyze this and break this down. And that's why he's done. Uh, benefits to the mind. Um, strength and focus, skills and creativity, um, ignore distractions. So this is something that is being observed in younger generations uh, where distractions are becoming a performance problem where younger children are not able to concentrate. It's, it's a problem. And this actually combats that. I teach my seven-year-old daughter meditation. Um, my son is sick and tired of me talking to him about meditation. Uh, but he has learned through osmosis, and he is a leader in his own peer circle, and helps individuals sort through their own depressions and problems. And he talks to me about those, and I'm, I'm honored. I, I, I love that. I love being a part of his life in that way. Um, but it has a lot of great benefits to an individual's state of mind. Benefits to the body. Um, these are mostly, mostly from the reduction in anxiety, stress, and things like that. So heart and brain problems, more longevity, reduces blood pressure, breathing and heart rate, immune system, all of those things. The things that are interesting is the way the brain physically changes. Um, the meditators, over time, lose less neurons than non-meditators as they age, okay? Um, by, by a wide margin, by like 20 to 30 percent. And so there is a lot of good evidence that they haven't tied it to dementia or any kind of mind problems yet, but if you ask me, I'll always vote for more neurons. Always. <laughs> always. <laughs> I am pro neuron. Yes, yes, sir, I am. And if I can, man, if I can sit there and my thinking, it doesn't cost anything. It's e, not easy, but it doesn't cost anything, and it allows you to do that. Uh, benefits to emotional regulation. These are the things most people think of when they think of a meditator. The guy blissed out on the cushion. He's always happy. All this great stuff. Um, it helps to prevent with a, a lot of issues because you're becoming more aware of what you're doing in the moment. When you're becoming more aware of what you're doing in the moment, then this, uh, emotional eating, um, working with pain. There's a lot of really good research on people who are working with chronic pain in meditation and being able to cope and manage it through meditation. And there's a lady that I work with that does pain management, and that's how she teaches. Those are the people that she teaches. And those are excruciating pains that these people are on morphine for, and they're like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. But when you're focused on it, and you're able to have equanimity with that <coughs> process that's happening, that pain, it is less painful. Um, this dude, Mathieu Ricard. Um, <clears throat> he is able to conjure, go ahead, oh, five minutes off. Uh, he is able to conjure <coughs> on demand a state of bliss that is higher than sex. <laughs> Measurable in an fMRI machine. <laughs> All right? <laughs> so, and, 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 really cool. 40,000 hours, I'll never get there, but you can do it. It can happen. It's freaking amazing. Uh, tiger on the strawberry. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, why don't people meditate? Okay. 
too hard, too long, too tired, don't have time, don't like it, I suck at it. Very common, very common. Um, easing into joy. Try and make it, uh, Chay Ming Pan takes this approach of try and make it easy. Okay? Step into a skill nicely. Uh, don't go and say, well, I'm going to start meditating and I'm going to meditate for an hour today. Bad idea. But like going to the gym and working out for an hour really hard. Bad idea. Start small. If you think you can do five minutes, do two. All right? Make it a habit. Make it fun if you can. Make it a part of an everyday experience. I do it in the morning because uh, I'm better at that time. Uh, the idea of a minimum effective dose. So put yourself on that path skillfully, please. Because um, what's going to happen is you're going to try something and you're going to hate it, and then you're going to quit. And so try something that's easy for you to achieve. Get that habit under you, and then start working. Informal practices, everybody understands sitting on a cushion. All kinds of other practices. Take one mindful breath while you're waiting. One seriously mindful breath. You're waiting all the damn time. Take a breath. You have time for a damn breath. Um, enjoy that first bite of food. Really sink in and savor that first bite of food. It's always the most delicious one. I mean, that first bowl of ice cream is great. The third, not so much. Uh, getting into the shower is one of my favorite meditative experiences. I absolutely sink into it and take that moment of time, and it's beautiful. Um, and it's a simple little micro hit of meditation, as my teacher calls. Um, and it's really meant to bring it into your daily practice. Do a little bit every day, and it becomes second habit, and it becomes a trait, and it becomes something that you do. Uh, here's the different areas that are uh, a part of that. Uh, Mantra, open monitoring, and uh, uh, focused awareness. So focused awareness is focused on an object. Open awareness is a noting of everything. Um, <clears throat> here's the note everything process. Uh, so C is everything you see out, as well as your visual mental screen. Here is everything you hear out, as well as your internal dialogue and the things you say to yourself. Feel are your physical sensations, so touch, smell, taste, as well as your internal emotional landscape. And as a part of this open awareness, note everything practice, you sit in a meditative pose and you simply observe where your mind goes with concentration, sensory clarity, and equanimity, and you watch it. And you get to watch your monkey mind go absolutely nuts. <laughs> Uh, focused attention, one mindful breath. There's some physiological things that happen with a mindful breath. Oddly enough, it actually stimulates a vagus nerve which uh, releases uh, a relaxation response in your body. I do this to my daughter. I'm like, she gets all spun up. I'm like, take a deep breath. And she hates it when I do that because it always calms her down. But, but it works. But there's the psychological aspect of it as well because when you're in that mindful breath moment, you're free from worry and regret. You aren't focused on the past or the future. You get to put those burdens down for even a little bit, which sometimes is a wonderful and beautiful thing. Uh, loving kindness and mantras. Um, the mind doesn't really know the difference between you creating a really wonderful experience in your head and the really wonderful experience happening. Um, you can positively reinforce yourself. Positive affirmations are, are a great example of that. Um, <clears throat> mantras are returning to that single point of focus. <coughs> Analytical meditation, this is the Dalai Lama's favorite. Um, <clears throat> and one of my favorite as well. Uh, where you see thoughts as thoughts. You question what is reality, what is the self. You contemplate impermanence, um, all that. So uh, that is it. Uh, I hope that it was entertaining. I hope that you learned something. I hope that it was, uh, it was good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Okay, raise your hand for questions. I'm going to come around and wait for the microphone. We'll start here. Um, obviously, you're a Zen Buddhist, and we it was brought up, what's going on in Myanmar? 
I just was wondering how many different branches of Buddhism are there and what are the differences in a general um, There are lots and there are lots of differences. Um, I, I, I compare it to uh, the belief in Jesus. Okay, there's lots of Abrahamic religions, right? Uh, they're all kind of different and weird and have these weird things. The Tibetans do the sand stuff. The, the Vietnamese do the saffron robes. The Rinzai monks face away from the wall, and the Soto monks then face towards the wall. I mean, it's really all over the place. It's all over the place on what the differences are. Uh, among the gurus that you mentioned, I believe you left out a very important one, which is my favorite guru, Thich Nhat Hanh from, from uh, Vietnam. Yeah. Batman is amazing. He is all about mindfulness. Yes. 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 Uh, right. he, he just had a movie that came out. Yeah. Um, uh, Walk, Walk with, with me. me. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Beautiful movie. Beautiful yeah. movie. Thank you. Movie. Yeah. Absolutely. Pema Kodron is another really, really good uh, Buddhist scholar that I follow. Yeah. Okay. Just a point of uh, confirmation. I grew up in a Pentecostal holiness environment. You had to concentrate on Jesus, God, being saved. Didn't matter what you did. Just concentrate on that. I discovered mindfulness. I discovered I've been to Tibet. I'm an amateur. I won't call it a religion, but is it a good substitute? Mm -hmm. I, I will say that there are many other contemplative traditions that have meditative practices. Okay, Because when you take it and you say concentration, sensory clarity, and equanimity, if you focus on the rosary, and you think about what you're doing on the rosary, sensory clarity, equanimity, well, maybe not equanimity, but, but definitely <laughs> concentration, <laughs> sensory clarity. But, but, but they all have that. Focus on the Word of God. When you're really in the Word of God, oh, the, uh, okay, yeah, sure. Maybe that's, maybe that's a concentration. Maybe that's a meditative practice. But I absolutely agree. Uh, there's many people, um, uh, some Amish folks I know, uh, that I read an article on, did a, uh, a meditative retreat, and they, they're Amish, and they take a lot of value out of meditation. Um, when you're talking about equanimity, um I know a lot of Eastern practices fall, do a lot of the same things, but I was reminded a lot of uh, the Taoist parable about the man in the waterfall. Um, have you read that or heard of that about the uh, Lao Tzu coming upon the man in the waterfall? Um, you know, he sees him going over, and when they come upon the man down below, um, he's fine. They thought he'd be dead, but he's fine. And he said, "I just let the waterfall take me. I don't fight it." Um, do you think that that is something that, this is more of a finer point than not a general question, but do you think that that is more like in line with Buddhist thinking, or is that like equanimity, or is that more kind of... Uh, no, so, so I don't when know you, when you don't asking. resist and you accept what is, okay? So there's, there's uh, Desmond Tutu did a uh, forgiveness, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Act, if you know about it. Uh, a lot of work on forgiveness and acceptance. Acceptance of what is is just acceptance of what is. And the world is going to be what the world's going to be, and you can control it this far, <laughs> right? <laughs> I can control it just about my skin level, maybe around my arms. But, uh, but yeah, I, I absolutely think that that falls in line. But again, it's not um, ambivalence or indifference or anything like that. I would swim my ass out of the water, not go over the waterfall if I could. I would take action oh, to prevent that. The man that. enjoyed it. The man oh. enjoyed it. He did it for fun. <laughs> hey, as long as, this is my Burning Man coming out, as long as you're not hurting anyone else, you do you. <laughs> you do you. <laughs> is there anyone that you can recommend that uh, has a solution to our, the capitalist system? The things that you're recommending like, would uh, destroy the drive to consume more. And without that, capitalism, I think, would be in trouble. Um, I don't really have an opinion on that, to be honest. I think that uh, 
the way we live is going to need to change. And in order to do that, um, we need to start with ourselves. And maybe that does result in less of a consumer economy. Okay, but we've got to do something. And what we're doing isn't working. And so I, I am a proponent of meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Ron, I believe, maybe I misunderstood, but I believe you said that <clears throat> working out hard for an hour and a half in the gym is a bad idea. No, <laughs> I said don't start out your workout regime that way. Okay. <laughs> the bad way to start. <laughs> okay, all right, thank awesome. you mu thank very you. much. Thank you. I get to continue on with the tradition. Can I do that now? Yep. That to say thank you to our speaker and to also mug him. <laughs> and our HSTP mug. So thank you again. This was wonderful.